Hi. In this video we're going to see if we can repair this Fozzy Audio N3 Bluetooth headphone amplifier. So this is a little device that's got a rechargeable battery in it and it can link to a portable device by Bluetooth and then it gives you an amplified headphone output just here which is ideal for driving larger headphones or any headphones that don't have Bluetooth connectivity and if you've got a phone or tablet that doesn't have a headphone socket. So I picked this up on eBay for parts or not working. I think these normally cost about 40 or 50 pounds. I got it for just a couple of pounds because one of the audio channels doesn't seem to be working. So let's plug it in and see if we can confirm the fault. PCBWay are the sponsor of today's repair video and PCBWay offer a wide range of manufacturing services including PCB manufacture, we can get PCBs manufactured with a whole range of different specifications whether that be on standard FR4 board or you can get them manufactured with aluminium, copper or even rigid flex PCB assemblies. PCBWay also offer mechanical manufacturing services including CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding. I'd also like to bring your attention to PCBWay's design contest. If you click on the banner at the top of the website when you visit them, there is the opportunity to enter into their design contest. If you submit your project there, there's the opportunity to win many prizes, including a first prize of $1,500 cash plus a $200 coupon. So don't forget to visit PCBWay.com. According to the user manual, we should be able to power it up and then start the pairing process. So we'll hold down the power button And then I think this means we've got full battery here and then the flashing blue light means it's ready for Bluetooth pairing. So let me see if I can pair it on my phone. Right, that's paired okay. We've got rid of the flashing blue light and now we've just got four red LEDs which I think means that we're at 100% battery power. But the illumination on these is pretty uneven. Uh, that one's a lot brighter than all the others so I'm not sure what's going on there. But if I play some audio on my phone and we look at the spectrum in the background we can see that we're only getting audio coming out of one channel. So certainly one is not doing anything. And the other thing that I've just noticed here is that the audio jack seems to be at quite an angle here. So I'm not sure if we've just got a simple problem with the 3.5 millimeter jack. So we've got some screws on the bottom here. Let's take the cover off and have a look inside. And that's what it looks like on this side. So it looks like most of the components are on the other side. Oh, but what's going on here? Let's zoom in a little bit. I'm not sure if this is factory soldering or whether someone's already been in here. I think it's factory, but it's pretty poor. You can see uh, this is the LED that was actually the brightest one, but it's right up against the diffuser. But it's also heavily discoloured and looks like it's been reworked uh, quite badly here. But the main problem here, as we can see, is this headphone jack is lifted off the board. And you can see also that the pad has been lifted with it. So I think this has probably been dropped while the headphones were plugged in and it's ripped the connector off the board. So it looks like we've got some rework to do. Let's get this PCB out from the enclosure. Here's what the PCB looks like on the other side. So we've got a multi-output DC to DC converter just here for providing the various supply rails on the board. We've got a linear charge controller for charging the lithium battery from the USB port. And then the main controller on here is this ATS2853. So this is a microcontroller that's got a BLE 5.3 interface on here. Here's the antenna associated with that. And then it's also got uh, various audio peripherals, including a 24-bit uh, D to A. We've got an ADC on here as well because this has a line input. And it also does have I2S interfaces if you wanted to connect it to other stuff. And then here's our headphone output. We've got what appears to be a class AB amplifier stage with an op-amp driving it for the feedback. That's fed from the 24-bit DAC on here. And then the line in, which seems to go straight down here, capacitively coupled into this op-amp here, and then into the ADC so that we can feed audio the other way. Now we've got some a little bit of bodgery going on here. We'll have to have a look under the microscope in a minute. And then just on the other side was where the uh, jacks were and that uh, quite poorly looking LED, so I think we might have to replace some of these. But I think the first thing to do is to disconnect the battery from here. This is permanently connected, so we do need to desolder these connections here. So here's the state of that 3.5mm jack. Now I am wondering if it's going to be a little bit easier and safer if I remove the lithium battery. Not sure how well this is going to be stuck down, so let's put the pry tool down there. Oh no, it's coming apart quite easy. 
there we go. Uh, I have put capped on tape on that lead to avoid any shorts, but that should be a little bit easier to work with. I'm not sure if we've got a pad here for a temperature sensor on the battery. Let's have a look under the microscope at the board. Yeah, so it looks like there was a pad for some temperature sensor or fuse or something like that underneath the battery, but there's nothing fitted here. There is a bit of copper randomly in the adhesive for the tape. Uh, and then we've got the rework on these LEDs, which is pretty poor. I think I've got some of these, so I might be able to solder something on there. This one's a different type, so I don't know if this, these are single colour. And this is the bicolour one that had the blue LED in here. And then here's our dodgy soldering around the headphone jacks. Now, I think these might be easiest to remove with some low melt solder. Uh, so that we don't end up with a whole load of mess from melting the plastic. And then just on the other side, this was that rework that was over here. Let me just adjust the focus a little bit. Here's the rework. So they've sliced the track that goes between these two pads just here. And then there's a track that goes all the way along this way. They've sliced that one and put a resistor across it. And left some of the copper from the tracers behind. And that looks like the same copper that was on the other side near those two pads in the adhesive. But I think the first thing to do is to see if we can remove these 3.5mm jacks. And in case you're wondering, this is the low melt solder that I'm using, SRA fast chip lead free alloy. It's pretty much the same as the chip quick low melt solder, but it's cheaper. So as you can see, when it was impacted, we lost a couple of pads here. First of all, make sure to remove any low melt solder because it will make any future joints on here quite brittle. And then let's get some IPA to clean that up. Here's what the jack looks like on the underside, and I think I found a similar item on DigiKey. So it's part number 54-00177. You can see it's got the same footprint, same two holes in the PCB, and also the same detail here for the internal switching contacts. So that's only 80 pence to replace. And we've got the data sheet here, which shows the arrangement of contacts internally. So we can work out which ones in particular we need to be careful of on the PCB. Looking at the PCB, I think there was only three terminals actually doing anything. So there's a ground pad just here. And although on the jack, this one over here is electrically connected to this one, it looks like they didn't actually connect it to the ground plane. Let's see if we can zoom in on that a bit more. Yeah, you can see there's a definite clearance between the pad and then there was a gap and then there's the ground plane. So that's why this one came off very easily because there was basically nothing attaching it to the board. And if we zoom out a little bit again, you can see here we've got the right channel going through to a via that goes to the other side of the board. This pad doesn't seem to be connected. There's a clearance around there. This pad isn't connected. There's a clearance around this pad as well, no vias. And then the left channel just goes through again to the other side of the board. And if we look on the other side of the PCB, you can see here that we've got um, the two vias that we're talking about. So left and right channel here, a resistor to ground, and then also these tracers go off to the headphone amplifier, in particular Q7 and Q11. So this should be a fairly simple repair. We just need to do a wire mod. And we also just need to make sure that the jack is more mechanically stable. When it comes to these LEDs, I think these are just red LEDs over here. So red, red, red. And then this one's a red and blue. So red, and you can see the blue dye just over there. So I'll see what I've got in stock, whether we can replace these. We could also just stick a 1210 LED on its side if I haven't got these in the same package. We've got a replacement jack here. Let's just double check it actually fits. Yeah, so that's definitely the right part. So now we just need to work out how we're gonna get the signal back to the left channel connection over here. So I think the first thing to look at 
potentially we could just drill through the PCB, but also we might be able to run a wire around this onto the other side of the board. So let's see how tightly it fits into the case. As you can see, there's actually lots of room to run a wire from this pad round the other side onto that resistor. The other thing we could do is scrape away the solder mask on this wire and then solder a wire on that wire and then onto this pad. The only difficulty with that is then when we solder the headphone jack onto that wire, there's a good chance enough heat will flow down the wire, it becomes desoldered here. And because it's underneath the jack, we can't actually verify that connection is good. So unfortunately, I think we're going to have to run a wire around the outside. The last step I think is to glue this connector in place to make sure it doesn't get ripped off the board again. Uh, we're going to use some of this UV reactive glue and just place a bit on each side to hold it in place. Right, we've got it all back together, everything slid in properly as you can see, so let's turn it on. Got the power button on the bottom. And yeah, it powers up okay. And also you notice the red illumination is a lot better than it was before. These three LEDs actually match quite nicely to that red blue one. So that's good. Let's plug it into the PC and see if we've got the second channel back. And so yeah, looking at the spectrum, you can see we've got the two channels of audio coming out. Now, let's just double check the volume control works. And yeah, that comes down okay. Uh, we've also got two switches here, bass boost and gain. So if we put the cursor somewhere near where we're peaking on the bass, if we turn this on, you can see we get a bit of an increase in the bass output, probably about 6 or 7 dB, uh, whatever this unit is on here. And then we've also got gain, which I guess is broadband gain. And possibly, yeah, there's a slight increase in that. It's quite difficult to tell with music playing. Uh, but one thing you will notice is the dynamic range seems to be a lot less than we had with the Cambridge Audio DAC that we repaired the other week. You can see the noise floor is somewhere down here. Now, I'm not sure how it's referencing these units, but it says about minus 120 dB. 
if we increase the volume, that only peaks at about 60. And when we had the Cambridge Audio DAC playing, although the noise floor was right down here, we were getting uh, the peak of the signal all the way up here. But I've not listened to this to see how it works. I'll quickly test it with some headphones, but I think we've got an effective repair here. And actually, it sounds surprisingly good. It was able to drive my 600 ohm biodynamic headphones once the gain was increased, then you get decent listening volumes from it. If you've got 32 ohm or 250 ohm headphones, then this will drive it absolutely fine with the gain turned off. The bass switch also does add a noticeable amount of bass to the audio. Uh, now, I'm not a huge fan of audio review terms, but if I was going to say anything about this, it probably just lacks a little bit of clarity compared to a higher end uh, headphone amplifier and DAC but it is perfectly good for listening and probably better than most Bluetooth headphones that I've heard when you're listening to it with decent headphones plugged into here. So not a bad option. Uh, fairly straightforward repair. You don't really know what you're getting when you buy something from eBay for spares or repairs, uh, but that actually was quite a low cost repair. That was uh, 80 pence for the headphone jack and a couple of pence for the LEDs. So uh, considering I only bought this, I think for four pounds, uh, that's pretty good to have a working unit. So that's it for this review. Uh, don't forget to visit our sponsor for this video, PCB Way. Don't forget to comment if you've got any thoughts about the video. And until next time, thanks for watching.